Good evening and welcome to the underclassmen course selection and conversation. Um, I am Rebecca Johnson and I am one of the counselors and I go with the musicians and the creative writers. We also have Ms. Hines here, a registrar. She will be speaking to you for a moment. And then Ms. Christina Ferris, who has the other art areas, she will be speaking last. So welcome. Um, our agenda tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about course selection the Texas graduation requirements, the differences between the levels of courses, GPA, elective waiver, rank, PSAT, and Naviance. So first off is course selection. That is starting um, next week actually with some of the 10th graders and Ms. Ferris and I will be meeting with all of the students um, you should be receiving an electronic copy of your updated transcript, which will have first semester on there, and we will be um, using those when we start talking about your course selections. So make sure you look over your transcript. Granted, we have to look over about 400 of them. You have to look over one. So if you notice anything that may be incorrect, let us know um, so we can get that taken care of. Next slide. So as I said, we will be meeting with our students for a one on one virtual meeting um, beginning next week. So even for those students that are at school, they will be virtually meeting with us. We will be calling through their um, social studies classes. And when we do that, it's very important that you accept our little call during class so that we can meet with you. Again, we will be going over your courses for next year and talking about um, graduation requirements talking about the levels of courses that you want. Um, and when we go through this process, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what colleges may be interested in seeing in the future on your transcript. Um, taking the higher level courses, you know, is, is a good thing on your transcripts. And we'll also need to think about what classes you want to take in college, what is your future plans um, to determine what type of electives, et cetera, you would be interested in. Next. Slide. So first, the Texas graduation requirements. All students are on the Texas Foundation High School plan with distinguished level of achievement, and this is a 26 credit plan. So there are specific credits that you have to earn in order to graduate, and then you have some that are electives, but they're really required because they are going to be your fine art courses. In English, everyone is required to have four English courses, English 1, 2, 3, and 4, and we have the different levels. Uh, for math, algebra, geometry, algebra 2, and then a fourth math. Social studies, everyone takes world geography, then world history, U.S. history, and then senior year would be the government and economics. For science, everyone must have biology, chemistry, and physics, and then they have an option of a different for, um, fourth science. For foreign language, you have to have two years of the same language. So that means you could do French one or two or um, Spanish one or two, but you have to have two years of the same language. You cannot do one year of French and one year of Spanish. It doesn't work that way. You also have to have a half a credit of health, one credit of PE, and one credit of fine art, which is not an issue because we have our fine art magnet and that's going to cover that as well as your electives for the 5.5 credits. Um, you will realize that we will have additional credits that you will graduate with because we are the fine art magnet and we do have the required of four fine art classes each year. Next slide. So the differences between academic pre-AP and AP classes. Um, we do have the opportunity for our students to take different levels of different courses. So just kind of going over a little bit about that. The academic level courses, um, they follow the regular TEKS of the course and they are on a 4.0 scale. And I will talk about um, the scale and what those points mean in a few moments. The pre-AP and honors level courses, 
Um, again, follow the teaks, but these are going to go into more information and they're going to be more complex. You're going to have a little bit more work to do outside of class and they do go at a much faster pace than the academic level. These courses are on a weighted 5.0 scale. Then we have the AP or advanced placement level courses, and these again follow an AP curriculum um, by College Board. These are college level classes, so again, these will have um, a higher standard, more rigor. There's going to be um, much more work inside the classroom and outside of the classroom to help prepare students to take the AP exam at the end of the year. The grade um, earned on the AP exam could potentially earn them college credit, so that's really important. And again, these courses are on a five point scale. So the academic are going to be a four point pre AP honors AP will be on the five point scale. Please note it's very important to consider the overall requirements of Kinder HSPVA when planning your courses because we do have a strong fine art program and they are very um, intense in, in their purpose and there are a lot of things that you have to be involved in with those art areas. You need to make sure that you are getting a balance and if you have not taken a large number of honors level courses, I would not recommend jumping, you know, with all four core areas in a higher level um, because you do need to balance that with your art areas and with the other things that you will be involved in on campus. Okay, next slide. Benefits of an AP class, um, there are several reasons that we recommend them. One, students enrolled in the AP courses at the end of the course, um, which is college level, you could earn AP credit um, or college credit because of your AP exams. You will earn a score between one and five and depending on the school and the number you get will determine what college classes that they will award you. You can potentially save money in college because you've already earned the credit in high school through the AP exam. Also, by earning credits, you could graduate college a little bit earlier by having some of those credits already taken care of. It also looks good on your transcripts for college admissions. It helps develop your college level skills. It prepares you for when you get to college so you're not overwhelmed because you already have a feel of what kind of balance you need to do with the academics. It's a increase in chances for college um, specific merit aid when applying for scholarships and that gives you more flexibility in the classes that you take in college and you could venture out and take more electives in college. For more information about the AP and the AP exams, please visit collegeboard.org. You will um, set up an account with them. Make sure you do not set up more than one. That will be repeated later. You should only have one College Board account. Next slide. The benefits again of the AP exam and looking at um, what college credit schools will give you. This is an example from the University of Texas website and if a student scores a three on an exam it shows you that they will give you um, whatever this CH304K would be um, and if you scored a four or five then they're going to give you additional credits. So um, with your with your score it will determine the number of college hours that they give you. Next slide. OK, GPA. Um, how does the GP work at Kinder P HSPVA? Well, HSPVA, we are on a four point weighted scale, so that means an academic class is going to be on a four point scale and our honors pre AP AP. Those are going to be on a weighted five point scale. And your GPA is based on your semester average. It's not based on what you did in cycle one, two, and three. It is what you do in the overall for that semester, including your final exam. Um, the GPA is calculated every semester. So once you finish the fall semester, grades are completed, then your GPA will update. 
at the end of the year after the spring semester, it goes through the same process. So if you were to ask what your GPA is at the beginning of the year, since you are already in school, you know, we would have it. But if you asked this in January, it would still be the same because we haven't finished up the entire semester. So it only changes at semester. And I've kind of done a breakdown of how you can figure out your GPA. When you're looking at academic classes, grades from 90 to 100 is, would be a 4.0, an 80 to an 89, a 3, 75 to 79, a 2, a 70, and that should be 274, typo, my bad, um, would be a 1, and then below 70, which would be 69 or below, would be no points. Um, on the AP side, notice it's the same number ranges, but the number is different for the point awarded. The A's would be 5's, B's, 4's, and so forth. So we have an example. If a student took two academic classes, they made a 95, which would be the 4.0, and 85, which would be the 3.0, and then for the pre-AP courses, they had a C, a B and an A. And once we add up those numbers and you divide it by five, it gives you what their GPA would be. So that's how you can calculate it. Um, please realize that middle school courses do not get counted in your GPA. So these are only going to be courses that you've started taking while you were on the um, high school campus. The GPA is updated again, like I said, each semester, and it is added to the transcript. And unofficial transcripts are available each fall um, with the updated GPA. And when I say fall, that doesn't mean the first week of school. Um, we have to get, get in the swing of things, and then we will get those out to you. Next slide. And then why is GPA important? Really what you do your first three years of high school is what colleges are going to base your acceptance with. So it's very important to do the best you can. You want to do the best you can all four years, but those first three years, that is the transcript they will see. You start enrolling um, or applying for colleges this fall of your senior year, so they're not going to have those records. So those people who go, oh, well, I'll wait, I'll do better my senior year. Well, I'll take that AP class my senior year. Well, we want it in, in the first three years and continuing in your fourth, but that is what you were showing people academically what you look like. Uh, the, transport, the transcript is an important tool for colleges in determining admissions, and they look at your GPA, they look at the type of classes that you've taken and that you've grown. Top 10% Texas public school university auto admit policy and the top 6% um, for UT, that's very important based on your GPA because that's going to fall in to ranking and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But again, keep in mind, this is just one picture of you. Um, it is a numeric type picture, but there is more to your story and you will be doing essays and things like that. So if there's anything that you've had to overcome in high school, you know, if you had a little blip one semester, you know, you will have the opportunity to explain that in your essays to colleges and things like that. One thing you need to keep in mind, everybody all over the world had to deal with COVID so that might not be one you want to focus on if you want to say something went on because everybody is dealing with that one. OK, next slide. And then just a quick breakdown of our current um, GPAs for our students. For the current um, sophomores, the first quartile is a 4.3077 to 4.5. Um, 172, and I'm just going to give you a, a moment to look over these. I'm not going to read them all because that's a whole lot of numbers. So if you just want to look and then below that we have the breakdown of the freshman class. And again, remember that's only one semester that's listed in there so far. So a lot of kids are going to have um, the same GPA right now. It's when you start getting more and more courses that the GPA starts spreading out a little bit more. OK, go to the next slide. So elective waivers. 
what is an, an elective waiver? Um, that is what a student can use if they have a grade of an 85 or higher in an elective course. And when I say elective course, I'm meaning anything that is not required for graduation. So it can't be your four English, math, science, those 26 credits I listed at the beginning. It cannot be any of those. It kind of it has to be above that. Um, each student may, uh, I'm sorry, going back and the option of that waiver is to keep something out of your GPA. Um, so each student may receive four half credit elective waivers throughout high school, but they must be used prior to their senior year. Um, what classes are available? Just kind of said that those not required for graduation. So it will be some of your art area courses and then um, foreign language past level two. Um, and then the last bullet, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Ms. Hines because I got stingy and I think I started doing all her work too. So it was nice seeing y'all and, and I'll stop talking. Ms. Hines, I would love for you to go ahead and take over and clear up anything I may have said. <laughs> you were perfect. Um, no, you did great. Um, I'm going to tag on to what she said about the courses that are not eligible for these waivers and the most common one I see is health. Health is required for graduation, so it is not uh, going to work for an elective waiver. So this is what used to be called a pass fail waiver. You take a class and you declare it pass fail, but what we determined last year was you can't like this doesn't apply if you fail because as you can see it only applies if you have an 85 or above. Okay. Um, so for the most part, this waiver helps students who have a, a higher than a 4.0 um, electives or, or sorry, arts and sports and things like that. Um, the legislature noticed that you can't get pre-AP weight for that. And so people in football and people in band were having their GPAs dragged down by these classes. And so they decided, all right, well, we'll let them declare them pass fail um, and our policy is 85 or higher only and um, it doesn't count against your GPA and drag that 4.3 down or whatever you happen to have. Um, okay so next slide. Isn't there another slide? Oh, okay um, you have to request the waiver during the semester you're taking the class. This is not a retroactive thing. So I know that most of you know it's about time for that because I've had a ton of emails. Um, I plan to send out the link to the, um, it's, it's done through a Google Doc, and I plan to send out the link for that uh, next week, but there are about 11,000 things we're doing next week sending out. So watch for that. Um, it'll also be on the website. It'll be in my auto reply. It'll be in all kinds of places, but it's called the elective waiver. Um, it's a Google form. And um, the deadline for that, as you can see at the bottom in the blue, is April 16th. Um, and that's firm, okay? So uh, if you, I mean, I, I shut down the form and I, I don't take late requests. It's really simple to do. You'll just, you'll, you'll fill out, obviously, name, ID, and then you just tell me which, which, um, which class you want to do your waiver. We strongly recommend that you do this before your I mean, we, we recommend you don't do it your freshman year just because you don't really have a baseline quite. And so you'd hate to be dropping, you know, good grades, A's. Um, but it definitely needs to be done before your senior year. And I think probably that most students take care of it by first semester of junior year. But if you're a junior right now, don't worry, because if you haven't done any of them, you can do all four of them this semester if that uh, suits your GPA purposes. Okay, the elective waiver will be void if your grade in that class ends up being an 84 or lower, um, but it doesn't really, I mean, it, it doesn't count against you because then I just cancel it, but your 85 stands in the class. I think that was everything. Um, do be watching for that along with about 20 other things that are coming to you this week. Done, done ski. Okay. So you managed to mute yourself again.
course. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christy Ferris and I'm the counselor for dance, theater and visual arts. Um, so welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. This is going to be posted online so you can go through those uh, GPA quartiles. Once you have that unofficial transcript, those were emailed out. Um, at this point to the 10th and 11th graders, they're going to be sent out to the 9th graders in a couple weeks and they've been emailed directly to the students HISD email account. So you might want to get your child to check their email, which would be very beneficial for school as well. Um, so a little bit about PSAT testing. So um, what is it? Why is it important? It's practice uh, for the SAT and the ACT, which are the standardized tests that at this point um, students and colleges use for admissions. So it gives you a baseline of, you know, having your student take it. How did they do? You know, what part should they study more for? You know, if we're going to do any prep or any tutorials, that can be a really beneficial score. Um, but keep in mind that the SAT is an 11th grade test. And so if your 9th or 10th grader, you know, didn't do as well on the PSAT, that does not mean that they're not going to get into college. Um, actually, the PSAT scores are not sent to the colleges. They are purely for your benefit for understanding for prep um, and for college boards national merit scholarships. Um, the only test that's used to determine national merit is actually the 11th grade PSAT and that's not announced until fall of senior year. So um, but usually what happens is the students take the PSAT, they get a good feel of what a standardized test is like, they get a good feel of you know their skills and they also then get on a whole bunch of lists to receive a whole bunch of mail from colleges from all across the world and they think that's really exciting because it feels like now they're very interested and so it gives you a chance to have those conversations and for the students to read about the colleges and start brainstorming. The PSAT is nationally offered every October. Keep in mind that is a non-COVID world of the PSAT being taken in October. Um, at PVA, our 9th, 10th and 11th graders would normally take it in October on that day and everyone would be in person. Um, of course, this year things were very different. So when it comes to next year, we don't know yet. We can't answer that question of what that's going to look like just yet. Next slide. OK, what's on the PSAT? So it has two sections. It has a math and evidence based reading and writing section. OK, so there's going to be passage based questions, uh, tables, graphs, charts, math problems with algebra, geometry and a little bit of trig. Um, to prepare for the PSAT, Khan Academy has free prep. College Board has good prep for the PSAT as well as the SAT, and all of that is free. I know ACT, I believe, even has like a, a question a day. They will text a student if they sign up for it. So everyone should sign up for that. I'm sure that they will love it. Um, also, when your PSAT scores are ready, College Board is going to email you and you will have an account to create with them. Do not create more than one College Board account. It can, can become very problematic um, later for students taking the SAT when parents create accounts. Um, that, that happens and scores get lost, deadlines get missed. Um, it's the same thing for college applications. Only students should be creating accounts. Um, and if you aren't sure if you have an account with College Board, if your child has an account, then you need to call College Board and work that out with them. And if you have multiple ones for one student, you need to get that worked out well before senior year so that everything is in one place. OK, next slide. OK, this is right off the press and we want to we want to share this with you before um, a letter goes out from Dr. Allen to to the students and parents. Um, our Northwest office is going to be meeting with TEA and then we're going to send a letter out. So we just wanted we know that there's some word out there and we wanted to address it. So for the current year, which is the 2020 2021 star testing or EOC exams. OK, as of today, the most recent information from TEA states that students who do who choose not to take the English one, algebra one, biology, English two and US history star tests this spring of 2021 will still need to pass these, these exams to be eligible for graduation in the state of Texas. That is information as of today. Is it possible TEA may change their mind? Absolutely. But we can't plan for that until we hear the official word from TEA. So today the official word is that these still need to be taken for children this year 
um, for them to be eligible to graduate. So that means any student um, 9th, 10th or 11th who does not come to campus for the spring 2021 star test will be scheduled to take that exam during another testing window. And I think the earliest one after the spring is in December of 2021. Um, so this is different from last year's star test, which was 2019, 2020. Last year, TEA, the state, granted a waiver from standardized tests for the 2020, 2019, 2020 school year only. And what they said is, is if that a student took, for instance, English one and passed it and earned the full credit within that school year, then they have a waiver from that exam and they don't need to take that pass that in order to graduate. However, that same student who is now a sophomore who doesn't come to school for the English 2 EOC will be responsible for taking the English 2 EOC in order to graduate. So that's the most updated information we have from TEA at this point in time. We wanted to make sure that you heard that from us um, and, and as things potentially change. Dr. Allen will be in touch um, with the students and parents about any updated information. Okay. Um, next slide. So, oh, it's the same slide twice, just looks a little prettier. Apologize for that. Next slide. Okay, so something that we want to talk about is uh, Naviance, but before we get into that, I want to share really quick. Um, I don't think that there's a slide for it in this presentation, but we did talk about rank and I want to make sure as an underclassman that you understand that HSPBA is a no rank school. So what that means is um, when you're, you're going to hear the term rank a lot throughout high school um, because it's very common that schools rank their students, such as the person with the highest GPA, meaning number one and number two and so on and so forth. So several years ago, PVA decided um, they, they watched other schools in the district stop ranking and they thought, you know, that might be a really good thing. We're going to try that. And since we stopped ranking, we have found that our college acceptance and our scholarship offers actually increased. Um, and so we decided to remain a no ranking school because as we talked about earlier with those elective waivers, our students are forced to take four art elective courses every year, which are all on the 4.0 scale. Whereas at other schools in the state, they can take four AP courses and just really get their GPA up there and their rank. And we don't feel like our students, um, a ranking reflects the amount of work that they put into it, nor does it reflect, you know, who, who they are as a student because they have to take these 4.0 courses and sometimes schedules don't work and they have to take an academic versus an AP course because of an art area that happens. When students are applying to college, we submit a school profile with all this information. Um, and so the colleges are very much in the know and um, when it comes to the auto admit policies, we do have a way of submitting some information to those Texas public universities when you're applying. So, so that you, you can benefit from the auto admit. But I wanted to just make sure you understand that as a whole, we do not rank. There is an option to opt out of that, but not until fall of senior year. So don't worry about it. Don't even think about it until then. So to prepare, for uh, the next couple of years, we, I want to make sure that you understand um, what tool that your students have access to. So they have access to the college research tool um, using Naviance and they can sign in using their clever account so they don't even need to remember a, a password and ID. So students actually use Naviance a lot their senior year in order to assist with the application season and ordering letters of recommendation and transcripts from the school. So in order to prepare for senior year, it's got some great tools and I just want to show you really quickly on the presentation. So on a normal Naviance homepage, you're going to see something that says my favorites and right now before senior year, the only thing you can go into is colleges I'm thinking about. So if you click on to that next slide. OK, it's going to take you to a list um, it, and it could be an empty page and up in the upper left hand corner, it'll say add colleges to the list. And you can then type in any college that that your child's interested in. 
Um, and remember, this is their account, so we really want them to do that, but you can do that with them as a parent. And it can be any school. Um, some students think, oh, you've probably never heard of, you know, but it's there, it's on Naviance. I had one student going to, looking at a school in the south of France, and it was on Naviance. So what you do is you add colleges to the list, you type in the names, and then they will appear. It's gonna give you lots of information, and each school becomes its own link. So if you click on the link, like where it says Savannah College of Art and Design, you would click right there at the name. Next slide. And then each school is going to have a, an individualized page with information. Some of them will have virtual tours. You'll have acceptance history of, of our PVA students going to that school and other really good information. You can get scholarship information, um, price, student life, um, just a whole bunch of information that can really help with the college prep process. OK, next slide. Another tool if on the and I, again, this is going to be posted on the web so you can all go back and see this, but on the main homepage in Naviance, there's a colleges tab and there's something called scattergrams. So if you look um, on the top left, you can see where you would click on scattergrams and it gives you an opportunity to type in or find a school name. And what appears is a scattergram of students who um, who applied to that school and whether they were accepted or not accepted. It also shows you a plot of their GPA and their SAT or ACT scores. So there's a lot of information there, a lot to play with, and it will even compare you to those students. Now keep in mind those students were applying their senior year. So if you're a ninth grader and you're thinking, oh, my GPA and uh, you have several years before you know before you have to think about that so um, but it really gives you a good idea of what they're looking for and sometimes you might see all across the board students who were accepted um, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense like well this student had a lower this and a higher this but remember there's a lot of auditions um, interviews portfolios um, just all of that that makes a big difference from students from our school so I just wanted you to be aware of these tools. Next slide. Um, also, if you don't know names of schools that you're interested in and you're kind of starting from scratch, College Supermatch, which is also on Naviance, will search for schools based on criteria. So if you look at the top, there's the criteria of location, academics, um, such as what major are you looking for, student life, diversity, um, characteristics, cost, athletics, resources, all of these things. Next slide. Um, so I went ahead and filled it out just to show you what happens. So I typed in a major, um, a public or private. Um, I wanted it to be LB, L, LGBTQ inclusive, um, you know, all of that. And so, and it also has a place to type in your GPA or test scores. I mean, there's a lot that you can put into this college match. And then what it does is it's going to come up with a list of schools that whether that list, whether or not they hit the criteria that you typed in. And so it's going to have the name of the school, how much it fits your criteria. So Ithaca College, um, I think that I put in tech theater as my major or maybe just theater and Ithaca College popped up. Um, with everything that I put in, it's 100%. So now, oh, well, what kind of, what's the average GPA for the school and the scores? Um, you know, and then I can click on Ithaca College and I can read all of that individual stuff about it. So it's a great way to start researching, creating that list. You can have 50 schools that you're thinking about, and then you can just over a period of time, mark, cut them down until you reach the ones that you want to apply to. Okay, next slide. OK, so just some FAQs about today going back to course requests. So um, once Ms. Johnson and I meet with your student, what happens if your child wants to change a course request? Course verifications are going to be sent out um, sometime this spring, most likely in May. So you're going to see what your child shows for their course requests for next year. Um, and again, it's just a request. There's going to be plenty of opportunity where that can be changed. Um, if your child's not happy with the level of class they sign up for once they start, what do you do? Well, in HISD, they do allow schedule changes the first 15 days of the semester. So let's say you, oh, I don't know if I want to sign up for AP US or academic, and you start the first day of school and you think, oh, this is just too much with everything else I have going on. And, you know, um, you can change that and you can move it down to academic or you step into academic and go, hey, you know what? I feel like I grew a lot. I feel like I can handle it. So 
we'll let you know how you can change your schedule in the fall um, and we'll have those conversations. Now remember, sometimes that means your the rest of your schedule is going to be changed as well in order to try to fit that because it's like a big puzzle. So we do our best to honor your requests, but sometimes the puzzle doesn't quite work out. Um, we always want to honor what you first requested, but because of the art area courses, because of our limited academic course offerings, sometimes it doesn't work um, and we will communicate to you when something isn't going to be possible or what the options might be. Um, on the HSPVA website, uh, hspva.org, we uploaded some tools to help you in the course offerings and um, to help you understand what you want for course selection. So if you go to resources at the top and you go to counselor, on the left hand side, it's going to say course selection offerings. So I put together some things, a lot of what we talked about tonight, also a list of what your course offerings will be for next year, and you can preview what they're what they're looking at for the next couple of years to prepare yourself. This is based on what we're offering um, and what classes we have currently. So there's always a possibility in August we might not offer a course. Something might change. Um, also, you never want to pick a course just for a teacher. I know they're wonderful and you want to be with them, but you just never know. So you want to really be committed to the course. Um, on the course offerings page, each course, not each, but many of the courses, specifically the AP and, and the pre-AP courses are linked to a video of the teacher describing the difference in levels and expectations of the class. So if you're thinking about, you know, wondering what the difference is and how to balance, that's something that you can watch. And there are also links of students who are enrolled in AP courses and testimonials from what they think and their perspective under the links. Um, what does this see what the student says? So it's just some really good tools to help you make the most informed decision. We're going to start with sophomores next year doing course selection next week doing course selection and we'll be meeting with um, freshmen. I believe the week of April 5th. Um, we're going to be sending out a little reminder of how to prepare for those um, and that's it. So in the chat we put a link if you could if you have any questions feel free to click on the link and you can send your question. It'll go into a Google Doc and we will then any general questions we will answer and post on the website with a copy of this presentation as well as the PowerPoint. And if it's a specific question that you would like us to email you back about, please note that and we will get back to you um, within the next week. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming and have a great night.